Heavenly Father, invite us deeper. Almighty and ever living God, you invite us deeper into your world, your people, your Lent. May this time be one of outward focus, seeking you in those we so often ignore. Help us to live a Lent focused on freedom, generosity and encounter. Give us hearts hungry to serve you and those who need what we have to give. In Jesus' name. Amen. There is a redeemer. There is a redeemer. Jesus, God's own son. Precious Lamb of God, Messiah. Oh, Jesus, my redeemer. Psalm 2 
Why do the nations conspire, and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up, and the rulers band together, against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, You are my son, today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron, you will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son, or he will be angry, and your way will lead to your destruction, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Today we are thinking not of human voices, but of the voice of God. As heard through the scriptures, prophetic voices down the ages that foretold of the one to come, the Messiah, his birth, his life, his suffering, his death and his resurrection. These words that speak into our history that give us hope and understanding of the God who is sovereign over all things. We've mentioned ancient prophecies about a future Messiah that the Gospels say were fulfilled in the life, ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus. Remarkably, scholars count hundreds of these prophecies in the Hebrew scriptures, over 300 in fact. Even more remarkable, these predictions were made by multiple authors over the course of about a thousand year time period. When the resurrected Jesus was eating fish with his disciples on the Sea of Galilee, he reminded them of the things that had happened during his ministry. For the first time, Jesus opened their eyes to all the prophecies that had been fulfilled by him. He said, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Luke 24, 44. Again, we're talking about Jesus being the fulfillment of over 300 prophecies without missing a single note. The odds of that happening by chance are zero. And so for any person to fulfill them all, it would take their circumstances being divinely orchestrated. In fact, that is the claim of the Gospels. Now, while many of the prophecies of the future Messiah were general in nature, some were very specific, like where the Messiah would be born and how he would die. The Messiah will be a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Judah, of the house of David. He will be conceived by a virgin born in Bethlehem and taken to Egypt as a child. The Messiah will be heralded by the messenger of the Lord and anointed by the Holy Spirit to minister in Galilee, perform miracles, and preach good news. He will cleanse the temple, enter Jerusalem as a king riding on a donkey, be rejected by the Jewish people and betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. The Messiah will die a humiliating death involving rejection, mocking, beating, the piercing of his hands and feet and the piercing of his side. He will be crucified with thieves 
and his executioners will cast lots for his clothing. They will give him gall and vinegar to drink, but unlike the other victims, none of his bones will be broken. In the end, he will be buried in a rich man's tomb, but will rise from the dead and ascend into heaven. But to you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. There are over 300 prophecies foretelling the coming of the Christ in the Old Testament, from his lineage and place of his birth to the year he would begin his ministry, to the circumstances of his death. The prophets Daniel, Isaiah, Micah, Zechariah, and others told of one who would be born of a virgin in Bethlehem and called Emmanuel, which means God with us. He would perform miracles, heal the lame, make blind men see, the deaf hear. He would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, and be welcomed as a king of peace and Messiah. They led like a lamb to the slaughter, taking the price of our sin upon himself. Fulfilled with the coming of Jesus, these prophecies reveal him to be our savior, our victorious king, both the son of God come to rule with righteousness and our greatest gift, the bringer of redemption. For to us a child is born, to, to us, us a, a son, son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Isaiah chapter 9 The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us, a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. To us a son is given. So, 
What difference does knowing all these fulfilled prophecies about Jesus and Messiah, what difference does it make to you and me and our journey of life and faith? Well, I guess it can help confirm our faith in the word of God. They demonstrate that God has always had a redemption plan set in place. It means we can trust God. God's timing may not be known to me, but it helps me believe that the future predictions about Jesus coming to wipe away sin and to eventually wipe away every tear from our eyes and no more pain, no more hurt, that too will come to pass. And so we should respond to that. Our response can be to keep living with a fire of holy expectation in our lives and to keep persevering, trusting, praying, sharing and serving. Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and we will be with him forever in eternity. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Hallelujah. So before our closing hymn, I just want us to reflect again on the whole biblical narrative of Jesus coming into the world. Why did he come? We call him the Redeemer, but how did he redeem the world? How did he come to speak into and bring resolution to our brokenness, the brokenness of humanity, your sin, my sin? Well, I want us just to reflect on that whole story to remind us of the true power of the cross and that one day Jesus will return again to take us to be with him for eternity. There's this crazy story at the beginning of the Bible. We have Adam and Eve, and they're in the Garden of Eden. And everything in this garden is great. It's exactly as it should be, except there's this one tree that they're told by God not to eat from because it's dangerous and it will kill them. So that's it. Uh, avoid this fruit tree and we're fine. Right. It seems pretty simple. But in this garden, there's a snake, and it starts telling a different story. It says that if you eat of this tree, it's not going to kill you. In fact, it's going to make you become like God. And Adam and Eve, they believe the snake and they eat the fruit. And because of this, the goodness of the garden is tragically lost and evil and death enters into God's good world. Now, why is there a talking snake in the garden? I mean, this thing is a problem. Yeah, it's very strange. And even more strange is the fact that the Bible doesn't say why or how this thing even got there. It just presents the snake as this creature who's in rebellion against God and that wants to get other people to doubt God's goodness and lead them on a path towards death. And so whatever this snake is, it's the source of evil that pervades our world and our lives even still today. But there is some hope because right here in the story, God makes this really interesting promise to Adam and Eve. That someone is going to come in the future, a son of Eve. And this guy's going to come and he's going to crush the serpent's head and destroy evil at its source. However, during this battle, the serpent is going to bite this guy's heel. So it's like a mutual destruction. Yeah, it's this very strange but beautiful promise. And it's just left hanging there until the next key moment in the story when God singles out this guy named Abraham and says that through his family, goodness and blessing is going to be restored back to all of the nations of the world. And as we follow this family, we get to one of Abraham's great grandsons, this guy named Judah. And he receives this promise that a king is going to come from his line and that the whole world's going to follow this king and he's going to bring peace and harmony and there'll be lots of food and wine and milk and vineyards and it's going to be awesome. The first king that we meet from the line of Judah is a guy named King David. And he's a hero. Maybe he is the snake crusher. But it turns out that David is infected with the same evil as the rest of humanity. He never crushes the snake, just the opposite. However, God makes a promise to David that this king is going to eventually come from his line. But as you go on in the story, one by one, each generation of his sons, they're just total 
chumps. They give in to the snake, they choose evil, they go after money and sex and power and following other gods. Things get so bad that they run the nation of Israel right into the ground, and the big bad empire of Babylon just takes them out. And so now there are no more kings to even fulfill this promise. So it seems like the whole plan is lost. But during these dark days, there's this crazy group of guys called prophets. And they just kept talking about this coming king and reminding us of the promise that he'll come, he'll defeat evil, he'll restore the garden. Now, one specific prophet, Isaiah, he tells us more about why this king is bitten. Isaiah says that the promised king receives this wound because of humanity's evil and that it kills him. But then all of a sudden he comes back and Isaiah says it's because he suffered this wound that he can now become a source of healing to other people. But the Old Testament ends and the snake crushing king that everyone's been talking about never shows up. And this is why when the New Testament begins, it introduces us to Jesus of Nazareth, not as some random guy, but as someone who comes to fulfill these specific ancient promises. Yeah, we learn that he's from the line of David, Judah, and Abraham. And he goes around Israel announcing that the goodness of God's kingdom is here now. And he begins confronting the effects of evil on people by healing them, by forgiving them of their sins and evil. Many people are now believing that this is, in fact, the promised king. But Jesus began telling his closest followers that he was going to become king and bring peace by taking the full effect of humanity's evil into himself. The fatal snake bite wound. Exactly. And so it seems like the serpent wins. And this story actually would be a tragedy except for what happens next. Jesus rises from the dead. And now Jesus has the power over evil and death for himself. And so the rest of the New Testament is then making this claim that Jesus' power over evil and death has now become available to us to begin confronting the effects of evil in our lives. But even still, death and evil are a real problem in our world all around us. And so the story of the Bible ends by describing this future day when Jesus comes back and he finishes the job. He destroys the snake once and for all and he restores the goodness of the garden here on earth.
Father, help me to live this day to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help me to give myself away to others, being kind to everyone I meet. Spirit, help me to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all I do and say. Amen.